So I've been, um, as uh, Pepper said, been asked very much to concentrate on fluid matters. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with enhanced recovery programs, the multimodal, multi-professional, best evidence-based, accelerated post-operative recovery of patients, the way you can tell a patient is on an enhanced recovery program is within 24 hours after, for example, major intra-abdominal surgery, the patient has no tubes, drips, drains, they're dressed, they're eating, they're drinking, and they're looking forward to going home. And it's commonly agreed that the three major elements that team anesthesia can contribute to that is high quality anesthesia and analgesia, trying to reduce inflammation by the things we do, and one of the very most important things is high quality fluid management. In the past, high quality fluid management hasn't, hasn't necessarily been exploited. You can be in the operating room, you can deliver a patient with zero balance who's centrally euvolemic, and afterwards, no one's made an attempt to get them up out of bed straight away and exploit the fact that they have no excess edema and they have an adequately perfused gut and they can eat and drink straight away. With enhanced recovery, where the ambition is to mobilize straight away and to give someone food straight away, high quality fluid management is absolutely essential. As I'll emphasize repeatedly during the talk, if a patient is left under resuscitated, they won't be able to stand up. They won't have a functioning gut. They won't be able to eat and drink. If somebody's salt and water overloaded, they also won't be able to do that. And I'm saying historically, when patients used to lie in bed for days at a time, that wasn't obvious. But now with enhanced recovery, it is completely obvious. So a few potential conflicts of interest. Uh, consult for Deltex and Edwards, some honoraria there. My chair is sponsored at the university by Smith's Medical. I run some educational meetings under the guise of EBPOM. Um, I'm on the editorial board of some journals, editor-in-chief of one of them, council member of the Royal College of Anaesthetists, chair of our board of the UK National Institute of Academic Anesthesia, I'm on the board of our Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine. We do some wacky stuff in the mountains under the guise of extreme Everest, some hypoxia research, and my role uh, rolling out enhanced recovery in the United Kingdom, I was supported by our UK Department of Health. As I said, I'm very much going to focus just on the fluid management component of it. This U-shaped diagram, which has been reiterated in the literature in various different guises, emphasizes the fact that fluid management is challenging, and being under or over um, resuscitated brings with it potential risk. So in the middle here, we have a symbol that represents the sweet spot. That sweet spot is influenced by the procedure, the patient's comorbidities, the level of preoperative hydration, whether or not the patient has had bowel preparation, for example, and the anesthesia, and whether or not you're using a neuroaxial block. A, a, a patient who has excess salt and water can end up with edema, ileus, nausea and vomiting, pulmonary complications, and cardiac complications, for example. So one might think, well, why not just restrict the patient? Why not give no more than two liters during the case? Whereas the other end of the spectrum, you get increased risk from organ hypoperfusion. You can get an ischemic gut, translocation, uh, inability to mobilize, et cetera, et cetera. So there is thought to be harm lurking at both ends, perhaps more at this end than this end. But you know we're professionals. We're there to do a job. So what we want to do is to hit that sweet spot. Now, here's that same curve flipped the other way around. This is the wine glass half full as opposed to the wine glass half empty version of it. And here, this is supposed to represent uh, a good effect, and this is supposed to represent the dose of fluid. And the sweet spot there is what we're trying to hit in every case. Just the right amount of fluid to ensure central euvolemia without excess salt and water. So the ideal scenario is a case is, uh, of a case is a patient is perfectly filled at the end of a case without carrying around extra bags of water and extra bags of salt. Now this language has been bandied around for 20 or 30 years ago. Broadly speaking, people would say, well, I'm a restrictor or I use liberal fluid management. And, and many of us believe this has been quite damaging to the field because it depends on your starting position. If you work in an organization that is historically very restrictive, places where people would try and not give, for example, more than those two liters I referred to, then if you decide to give three and a half liters to hit the sweet spot, then you're accused of being liberal compared to the restrictors. However, if you work in a place that routinely gives five and a half liters, 
and you decide to give the right amount being about three litres, then suddenly you're a restrictor and it's producing the same benefit. So that language needs to be abandoned. What we're seeking is central euvolemia with a zero balance approach. The other thing we recognize is the size of the sweet spot is very much dependent on the individual. So a young, fit, healthy person, you can actually be pretty sloppy with your fluid management and hit the great big sweet spot in the middle. A few liters here or there aren't going to matter. But as age increases and the organs begin to fail, the elderly patient with diabetes, with heart failure, with lung failure, with kidney failure, that sweet spot's getting smaller and smaller. And being able to hit that without some degree of advanced hemodynamic monitoring is not, it's not plausible. It's not, it's not a rational objective. So this shows that if you imagine the magic number that you might choose, as the sweet spot shifts around in older patients with more comorbidities, you, you can't hit it with a recipe approach. You can only hit it with a guided or a targeted missile. We produced some guidelines in the United Kingdom a number of years ago. British Consensus Guidelines for Intravenous Fluid Therapy for the Adult Surgical Patient, written between intensivists, anaesthetists, biochemists, renal doctors, surgeons, etc. And right at the heart of it, the strongest recommendation we were able to make, the only one that we thought we could assign a level 1A of evidence to, was the statement at the top, recommendation 13, that reads, in patients undergoing some forms of orthopedic and abdominal surgery, intraoperative treatment with intravenous fluid, note we couldn't say which one, to achieve an optimal value of stroke volume should be used where possible as this may reduce post-operative complication rates and duration of hospital stay. Level 1A for abdominal surgery, 1B for orthopedic surgery. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, this um, study, I think, uh, in healthy volunteers, very clearly explains the, what we're trying to achieve with the Guytonian approach of measuring stroke volume, not cardiac output, to try and achieve central euvolemia. I remind you from the uh, physiologist, ph physiologist perspective, central hypovolemia is, is deemed to be a left ventricle that has a response to preload. So when we are lying flat on our back at sleep, our left ventricle is optimally filled. That is normality. So if you read with you here, this study in healthy volunteers, in healthy su supine humans, the heart is provided with a volume that is sufficient to secure a maximal stroke volume without distending the heart. The implication for individualized goal-directed fluid therapy is that when a maximal stroke volume is established for patients, cardiac preload is comparable to that of supine healthy subjects. Now, there's been a little bit of dispute about that in the literature recently with a leg-raising experiment, but if you look back historically over years, this seem, seems to hold as a central and plausible tenet. You're not trying to overload the patient. You're still going to have some venous capacitance, but you're just saying if the heart is optimally filled, it's being its most efficient, and that is central euvolemia. So to put that another way in this cartoon, when you have a patient who's hypotensive or tachycardic, for example, they have a reduced stroke volume. When you give a fluid bolus, the reason the heart rate calms and the blood pressure comes up is because you're re restoring left ventricular end diastolic volume. Now, with multiple comorbidities, complex surgery, hard to measure losses, it's harder to hit that point judged purely by heart rate and blood pressure, which is why we turn to measuring stroke volume in different ways. So the hypothesis is cardiac, oh, it's giving fluid challenges to achieve maximal cardiac stroke volume fills the intravascular space to a maximum safe volume. No suggestion of overload at all, just hitting that sweet spot. That avoids central hypovolemia, and thus tissue hypoperfusion. Very small components of hypovolemia can produce very deleterious effects on peripheral perfusion, particularly the GI tract. So I took part in an experiment about 20 years ago where six of us in London, this is published in a, in a, a premier intensive care unit uh, journal, tw uh, six of us took 25% of our blood volume off and demonstrated that heart rate and blood pressure are unchanged but you completely lose the blood supply to your GI tract. So you can imagine if you're doing GI surgery, you'd be operating on a, on a gut without a blood supply. And I'll show you some evidence later on that supports that hypothesis. With regards to the choice of fluid, <coughs> myself and John Myberg 
often use this particular can you pass the water there for a second? <coughs> this particular cartoon to try and summarize the debate over the decades about the choice of fluid. This represents the colloid crystalloid debate. When I got married, I used to hang the loo paper, the toilet paper, in position A. My, so, and Pepper says that's the correct way. My wife was shocked by this. She said this represents that I'm some form of, uh, 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 of, of a deranged individual, and obviously the correct way to hang the loo paper is in position B. I promise you that the important thing is what you do with it, not which way round you hang the roll. So the executive summary with regards to the choice of fluid, colloid, crystalloid, albumin, etc., etc., it may make a difference, but it's extremely hard to demonstrate. However, if you look at the dose and the timing of the administration of that fluid, like this product here, it can have very dramatic effects on what happens next. So if we look at this review article, for example, that myself and John Myberg uh, wrote and was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, despite decades of there being research into the choice of the type of fluid, the evidence-based conclusion remains that there is little evidence that resuscitation with one type of fluid compared with another reduces the risk of death or that any solution is more effective or safer than any other. So anyone who has very strong beliefs who tries to force them upon you, that it is now clear that fluid A, B, C, D, or E is the right evidence-based fluid to use during surgery, they're referring to an evidence base that we couldn't find in any guideline in, or in a publication that's in the New England Journal of Medicine. So if, if you can find that, please do bring it to us. The really important thing is timing and dosage. So as part of our enhanced recovery endeavor in the United Kingdom, we were having a difficult time with getting consistency in perioperative fluid management. So we as a leadership team, who've been appointed by our Department of Health, decided to write a consensus statement on perioperative fluid management. This is 50% uh, anesthesia intensive care, 50% surgeons, general surgeons, gynecological surgeons, urological surgeons, orthopedic surgeons. And what we thought we'd do is get in a room and just agree about what we agreed about. We would park what we disagreed about. So for example, we said, do we all agree that giving a patient too little fluid is the wrong thing to do? And we unanimously agreed. Do we agree that giving a patient too much fluid is the wrong thing to do? And we unanimously agreed. We then tried the colloid crystalloid thing, and half an hour later of people shouting at each other, we agreed to park that issue, because the reason there's so disparate, such disparate, strong opinions is because there's this lack of an evidence base. So we went through all the various elements and we came up with some very simple, pragmatic, technology agnostic recommendations that we thought represented good perioperative fluid management. And at the heart of it, remember this is for the NHS, uh, which has very little money to spend on healthcare. We said that the Enhanced Recovery Partnership recommends the use of intraoperative fluid management technologies to enhance treatment with the aim of avoiding both hypovolemia and fluid excess. But the next bit's the really important bit. That's not for every single patient. You, you can't justify it for every single patient. The, the younger, fitter patient having lower risk surgery, you can hit that sweet spot by having a little bit of randomness in your therapy. It's for the higher risk patients having higher risk surgery. And we said that this should be decided on a case by case basis, adhering to local guidelines that departments have put together based on their experience, their choice of monitors, the patients that they see. And they should do that in the context of your own national and regional guidelines. And in the UK, they're nice guidelines. We also really emphasize that if you're going to do very high quality intraoperative fluid management, around that, you must do everything possible to use the GI tract. So if you keep a patient hydrated and possibly carbohydrate loaded preoperatively, and you get that IV down as quickly as possible postoperatively, because you've done a fantastic job in the OR, then you will reap all the benefits from enhanced recovery programs. If you don't look after the bit before and the bit afterwards, then your efforts and endeavors in the operating room can be undone. And what do I mean by that? Let's imagine that you've done a fantastic job in the OR, you've landed a patient pain-free with regional anesthesia, 
You've landed them wide awake so they can eat and drink straight away. You've landed them euvolemic and you've, you've got them in zero balance. And the next minute, a resident, according to some standing orders, hangs litre after litre after litre of saline in the middle of the night to treat little dips in blood pressure and oliguria. So that undoes all of that good work that you have done, and vice versa. So we said, avoid post-op IV fluids whenever it's possible. Get that IV down and get the patient drinking. Always ask the question, what are you giving that fluid for? If you're giving it for so-called maintenance that I will come back to in a moment, then try and use the GI tract because the GI tract is very clever. You can take in very large quantities of fluid and manage that in a new, numerous different ways. But once you put it in a vein, it becomes more difficult. If you truly mean replacement, then consider oral before IV and consider prescribing oral fluids. If you really mean resuscitation, then use a goal-directed approach. And goal-directed doesn't equal cardiac output measurement. Goal-directed means I think the patient needs resuscitating, I have a physiological goal, I give an amount of fluid, and I achieve that goal. If I don't, I'm doing the wrong thing. To refer you to some of the recent literature, which has helped in some way to clarify the issue, but continues to leave us slightly confused, I refer you to the largest prospective randomized controlled trial of goal-directed therapy, not goal-directed fluid therapy in isolation, published in JAMA relatively recently. It's about a 700 patient multi-center prospective randomized controlled trial from the United Kingdom uh, by Professor Rupert Pierce. And it's looked at, as it says on the title, the effect of perioperative cardiac output guided hemodynamic therapy algorithm on outcomes. Now, this is a little bit different because it combines a goal-directed fluid therapy with the fixed dose administration of a vasoactive drug. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it in detail, because of prior art, the drug they chose was dopexamine, which isn't commonly available in much of the world. But, and, and, and in the end, they had their primary outcome variable showed quite a marked difference consistent with the previous studies, but the p-value was 0.07. I'll just show you the mortality effect. So the, the fluid management in this was stroke volume, colloid boluses, et cetera, et cetera. This is looking at mortality out to 180 days. That's the intervention limb, and that's the usual care limb. A very dramatic impact on long-term mortality with a very dramatic reduction in morbidity uh, uh, as well. But in both cases, the p-value is slightly higher than the magic 0.05. So for those of you who aren't used to judging point estimates in this way, this means that strictly speaking, this is not a positive result. In other words, it's not statistically significant because you can't say with greater than 95% confidence that that is a real effect. But you can say with greater than 90% confidence that that is a real effect. Now, what would you do about that? Uh, we don't know the right thing to do in the UK. The people who practice this way will almost definitely keep practicing this way. The people who are thinking about practicing this way might decide to practice that way, and, uh, but there's no compelling reason to absolutely adopt it. We've decided to design a new trial, which will be the, the uh, power calculation. We've submitted the grant application. The power calculation puts you over 4,000 patients to do it. But that's going to take a long time to complete. So what do you do in the interim period? I can share with you what the statistician said, allegedly. The statistician who doesn't understand the intervention said when they broke the code and assigned the p-value. The statistician allegedly said, I don't know what all this means, but if I get sick, can I be in this group, please? <laughs> so I'd, I, I ask people to reflect on yourself. Given the choice at the bedside, do you want to be in that group or that group? Anyway. They were asked by JAMA to put those results into the previous Cochrane meta-analysis to see if the impact of the largest randomized controlled trial reinforced all the results to date or took the result in a different direction, swung it back towards the middle. And actually it reinforced the finding over the decades that this sort of approach, uh, a, a cardiac output guided fluid and drug administration using a goal-directed approach looked as though it had a significant impact on length of stay, morbidity, and possibly mortality. So if you cast your eye down, the favours intervention go out to the left of the line, 
and the favours control go out to the right of the line. So almost every trial over the decades has gone left, either touching the line of unity or not touching the line of unity. So the summary statistic gives you a p-value of less than 0 0.001. So back to this U-shaped relationship. We, in our consensus statement, said, well, one of the things we think is hampering us is we haven't, we haven't clearly stated what good looks like or what bad looks like. We've tried to say how we think you can achieve good, but the reason that adverse events related to fluid management go relatively underreported is because we're not giving it the same importance as forgetting to give the antibiotic or forgetting to give the DBT prophylaxis. If we, if we don't do those things in our organization, we're in big trouble. However, if we land someone in the recovery area, overtly hypovolemic or hypoperfused, no one seems to get too stressed about it. So we said, well, we know what that looks like, hypovolemia or hypoperfusion, cold, tachycardic, acidotic, oliguric. If you see that, we say you should report that as an adverse event. Likewise, we know what fluid excess looks like. If a patient lands in the recovery area more than two liters positive, then someone's done a bad job, someone needs to report that as an adverse event so that it gets investigated, so we do a root cause analysis, so we learn from that because it's, it's hurting patients, maybe hurting patients more than forgetting to give the antibiotic or forgetting to do the DVT prophylaxis if you look at those survival curves. So that brings us to a simple recipe for perioperative fluid management for major cases. Try to do the least possible harm preoperatively. This is what an enhanced recovery pathway would look like for colon surgery, for example. Try and avoid all these bad iatrogenic things that are not evidence-based and only hurt the patient. Bring them to the operating room hydrated and carb-loaded. If they do have complex losses, that's difficult, so employ an expert to sort it out. Maintenance is at a much lower level than that historically reported. So when I was a uh, starting off in anesthesia, the textbooks used to say about 20 or 30 mils per kilo per hour of maintenance for an open belly case. That's complete nonsense. There is no third space to fill. The evaporative losses are way, way lower than we were told historically. And if you bring them to the operating room hydrated and carb loaded, then there's nothing to chase after. So one to two mils per kilo per hour is about right. Avoid crystalloid excess, particularly saline, the excess of salt and chloride, and don't use a recipe book. The idea that somehow you can hit that sweet spot by giving seven mils per kilo per hour or some magic number is just complete nonsense. It's non-physiological. So if you are going to give uh, uh, resuscitation fluids, use boluses to achieve an optimal stroke volume guided by appropriate technology, which at one end of the spectrum is heart rate and blood pressure, and at the other end of the spectrum is measures of cardiac output. This. Um, over the decades is what I've learnt is what I think is this secret killer, putting it bluntly in the background. Even people using goal-directed fluid therapy, the concept of maintenance is so varied that we get these crazy patterns of quantities of fluid given and outcomes. So as I've said, you know, the current thinking is <clears throat> one to two mils per kilo per hour is plenty. And what I've learned from my surgical colleagues over the years is because we tend to talk about fluid management and focus on the water. We tend to describe it in the water amounts, five liters, three liters positive, whatever it is. It's not the water that does the harm. W water is relatively easy to get out of a reasonably healthy body. It's the salt that is doing the harm. So just to remind you, this, these slides I got from Andy Shaw and John Kellum in the USA because they got some US product in them. How much sodium chloride is there in each liter of saline? Well, saline's 0.9%, so therefore there's nine grams in one liter. And to remind you, a normal salt diet for us trying to be healthy is about four and a half grams a day. So one bag of saline contains two days of salt. A high salt diet is six grams per day. So it's one and a half grams of a very high salt diet. The potato chip equivalent, these are US potato chips, Lay's, big grab bag, is, is the salt equivalent of 25 bags of potato chips in one litre of normal saline. Now this slide, when I saw it from John and Andy, really got me thinking, well that's, that's a big deal, that is worth thinking about. So let's imagine you leave a, a patient 
four litres positive at the end of a case in the recovery room. That patient is now carrying around four litres of water and the salt equivalent of 100 bags of Lay's potato chips. And if they've got background heart failure, lung failure and kidney failure, they have very, very little chance of getting them out of that body successfully in the days that follow without very significant help. Now, is this just, are these just the rantings of an old man? Well, uh, possibly, but um, here's, an, here's an example from three recently published papers. These, these are high quality journals, the British Journal of Anesthesia, JAMA in the middle, and Anesthesia and Analgesia at the bottom. And they're all published within the last three years. And if you look at the papers, those three papers, the spectrum of maintenance fluid in those three papers goes from one mil per kilo per hour of 5% dextrose in a study that produced the most positive result to 10 mils per kilo per hour of Hartmann's, which is lactated ringers, which is essentially saline-like, in the only study that's shown us a negative result. So for a three-hour case in this goal-directed therapy study, I'm going to get about this amount of water and three little pieces of a candy bar. That's what I'm going to get. In this one here, I'm going to get three liters of water and the salt equivalent of 75 bags of Lay's potato chips. And they wonder, or we wonder, why the results are different. It's because we're not looking at the real issue. They were both centrally resuscitated. These patients are possibly pickled in saline, whereas these patients have got just the right amount of water and sugar to maintain them. This is what possibly it should look like. This is the recent study from Duke published using both an enhanced recovery approach and goal-directed fluid therapy. And you see here from pre-ERAS to post-ERAS, the crystalloid has gone down by about a litre. The colloid, given in a targeted way, has gone up, but only by 300 mils. So the total amount of fluid has gone down. And one of the key things is post-operatively, rather than the patient's getting an IV for two days post-op on average till they were drinking, they're drinking within about 12 hours. So that post-op IV, that drip with all the salt and the water is down and the patients are drinking, which is the right thing to do. My final slide is there's a simple one-slide recipe for high-quality perioperative fluid management, in my opinion. It's interesting it fits on one slide. It's not difficult. Avoid the iatrogenic harm. If you do need complex losses replaced, employ an expert because it is very difficult. Maintenance should be at a very low level and a mil per kilo per hour of D5 currently looks the best evidence-based approach. Avoid crystalloid excess, especially those hundreds of bags of Lay's potato chips. And if you are going to give fluid boluses for resuscitation, I would encourage people to use a goal-directed approach to achieve an optimal stroke volume guided by the appropriate technology which isn't always cardiac output measurement, but is as you move up the spectrum of increased risk surgery and increased risk of patient. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to the discussion later.